Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. We have a few stragglers coming in. Um, uh, the speakers are staying at a hotel which had a pool party last night in honor of the Taylor Swift concert. So there's loud music and a lot of semi-naked participants going on to quite late. So I'm sure some of the participants are still getting up. Um, thank you to Clem on again for organizing a very interesting uh, symposium. Uh, we've had great uh, discussions uh, in and around the talks. It's been really wonderful. I've learned a lot already and gotten a lot of um, instructive advice and criticism. Um, so this has been very, uh, very important. One of the things I've noticed is that I think the conference has concentrated on the interactions and the connective tissues between the cultures along the galleon trade. Funnily enough, what this means is that the two 17th century superpowers are unrepresented, and they are China and Spain. And this is a nice corrective to the way we often think about the world. So um, a part remedy of this is, uh, is the talk of the next speaker about China's relationship with Spain through the galleon trade. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Bill Sargent to speak on this subject. Um, he was long the curator of export art at the Peabody Essex Museum in Massachusetts, so he built a fantastic collection there. He is a longtime friend of the Asian Civilizations Museum. He's come to speak several times. He's advised us on building the collection of export ware, and some of the impressive things that you see in the galleries are because of Bill's advice. So um, he has my sincere thanks in building a great museum. He's continued to work with Kenny and Clement on in making major acquisitions around this particular exhibition. Very impressive indeed. So it's a great honor to welcome Bill Sargent to speak. Thank you, Alan. Um, I, oh, good. I, I looked at the countdown clock. It's. I have 30 minutes. Um, I have my text prepared because I want to fit everything in in the 30 minutes. But I want to add my uh, thanks to uh, the Heinrich Foundation, to the Ambassador of uh, Mexico, to uh, Clem, of course, who uh, I've worked with for a long time, putting together a magnificent exhibition and catalog and some seminar. Uh, we've all learned so much and shared so much. That's what's important about these seminars is educating the public and sharing everything we can. Um, uh, so uh, you might notice that um, I have a different title than the one in the program because when I first got this request, uh, I said, well, I'll talk about China trade and, and uh, Spain. Uh, and then I thought, I can't talk about the entire China trade in Spain in a half an hour. So I'll pick one subject, which will be ceramics. So I'm going to be talking about ceramics. Uh, Spain tried, tried several times uh, to um, establish itself in China in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, but failed. So the export goods celebrated in this exhibition, and that's what I'm talking about, including porcelain, were generally acquired through Chinese merchants and dealers in Manila. This is a late 18th century gouache painting one of 34 in a series depicting the processes of porcelain production. In it, Western merchants can be seen in the lower left holding sacks of Spanish silver dollars, the international trade currency at the time, with which they will pay for their selections in the merchant's shop on the right. The vast majority of porcelains were created in Jingde Zhen, the porcelain capital of the world prior to the 18th century. At the beginning of the Man Manila galleon trade, Porcelains readily available were blue and white and produced exclusively in Jingde Zhen. Orders from clients in Spain, New Spain, or the Philippines would be uh, delivered by Chinese merchants to their counterparts in Guangzhou, then transferred to Jingde Zhen, where they would be fulfilled, then delivered back to Guangzhou and on to Manila for use there or for shipping onwards to Spanish clients. Documentary evidence, however, of the trade um, in porcelain is uh, a, a bit lacking, uh, but the objects uh, are there. In the 1570s, uh, two galleons to Acapulco 
brought 22,300 pieces of fine gilt china and other porcelain wares. That's a quote. So this is a, um, a painting of uh, a, a piece from that particular time that could have been uh, in that cargo. Um, and Francesco Carletti, a uh, Florentine merchant who wrote of his travels in Mexico, Manila, and beyond, remarked, quote, from the merchandise brought there by the Chinese and then transported to Mexico, they earn 150 to 200 percent, that's end quote. So th this, this was the motiv one of the motivating factors is, is uh, profit. Further, he stated, quote, porcelain and very many other sorts of merchandise from all of which they make very noble trade with the Spaniards who buy it from them and take it to Mexico and New Spain. In 1604, Tonati, a Cora chieftain in an indigenous ethnic group in western central Mexico, purchased a set of Chinese porcelain dishes for his personal use. They were shipped from the port of San Blas on the Pacific coast in the state of Nayarit. In 1640, a record of the preparations for the arrival of the new viceroy, the Marquis of Alenia, when he moved into the royal houses of Chapultepec, listed room after room of excessive displays of wealth, including, quote, the table covered with a gauze tablecloth embroidered in gold and set with the finest china. At the far end, there were two exquisite gold Chinese screens to shield the musicians and the instruments from view, end quote. But some of the porcelains, whoops, sorry. I should keep it this one. So could some of the porcelains look, look, look to like this elegant bowl? To simplify a complex story of centuries of trade in porcelain, I'm breaking this talk into two major parts, general market wares and special order wares comprising commemoratives and armorials. And first, blue and white, which was the primary export porcelain in the earliest period. And those consisted of serving pieces in a style known as crockware, recognized by panel divisions on the border that you see in the large uh, piece on the upper left. Among the larger forms were storage jars, uh, typical of Chinese um, decorations. Uh, I, I think I've lost a slide. Here on the, uh, let me, let me, yeah, here it is. Uh, here, here is a, a Chinese cloud scroll design on the large jar. Such jars were used in New Spain for storing valuable commodities such as chocolate. Apparently, the worry was not such that jars could be carried off, because they could have done very easily, uh, but that household staff or maybe children uh, could do easily access something that needed to be parceled out carefully. These jars were uh, easily imitated by local potters in Puebla, uh, which we will see more of, I think. Uh, Francesco Calati himself bought a full set of blue and white uh, porcelain with blue decorations by the intermediation of the fathers of the Campagna de Jesus, who also intermediated to buy five jars, which probably looked like this. Blue and white bottles copying European glass forms used for transporting alcoholic beverages were reused as uh, flower vases on the altar of, in this painting of the Christ of Chalma. Similar bottles are displayed in the exhibition. Blue and white porcelain of the 18th century was frequently decorated with generic landscape scenes uh, surrounded by floral sprays as represented in this interior still life painting of about 1769. When the kilns closed at the fall of the Ming Dynasty in the mid 17th century, Western traders turned to Japanese potters in Arita to fill orders that could no longer be supplied by China. This color palette comprised primarily underglazed blue, iron red, and gilding. When the Chinese kilns reopened in 1680, Chinese potters created wares in the pattern and color their customers were familiar with, what we now call Chinese amari. A shard of this particular color and pattern with the bifacial eagle was found in the Zocalo of Mexico City, so we know it was for Mexico. Large jars seen uh, today in the Casa de los Azulejos, um, you see in the, your right-hand side, 
Uh, this is an example now used as a lamp, uh, and in the portrait of Senora Sanchez Celis of 1883, attests to the popularity of large Chinese Amari jars in Mexico. Speaking of the influence of Japan on this palette, I couldn't resist in using another version of the Christ of Chalma, this time including four jars and showing Japanese porcelain versions similar to those in the exhibition. I'm going to talk about chocolate uh, here, but this, I'm not going to talk about chocolate here. Uh, <laughs> I've talked about it in the catalog, believe it or not. Uh, but this painting gives us the opportunity to talk about three forms most frequently associated with China and Spain. The chocolate pot, the mansorina, and the uh, uh, chocolate cup, as well as the stirrer uh, the subject holds in her left hand. Uh, the chocolate pot is in opaque enamels, which were introduced to China from Europe about 1715, and by 1730 had nearly, but not quite, replaced blue and white as the most popular color category. This technique uh, allowed the use of enamels in a more painterly style, blending colors and increasing the hues available. The expense of producing these wares ensured the blue and white would continue for a certain segment of society, however. This example, which we often call a make-do, in that it is a, a damaged piece that has been um, refitted. The handle has been lost and the lid has been broken. So the handle has been replaced, and it would have been a, a side-handled uh, coffee pot originally. Um, but because the lid was obviously broken, it was cut down and then remade into a chocolate pot. It's a very clever uh, reuse of something if, in my way of thinking, a totally impractical uh, reworking of a damaged piece, as I would imagine that the twisting of the stirrer would rattle the lid and <laughs> I, I don't know how they did it. Somebody had to have a steady hand when they did that. Uh, chocolate cups were, uh, oh, there's a detail of it. A great acquisition. Chocolate cups were generally slender, slightly bell-formed tall cups. Marie-Louise of Orléans, queen consort of Charles II of Spain, had in her 1689 inventory, among many other Asian treasures, quote, 40 wine cups, or jicadas from China, a white cup, sorry, white cups, jicadas from China without mounts. Uh, jicada is the Spanish word taken from, from the Nahuatl for the gourd cups used in drinking chocolate. In this still life, three ceramic cups are depicted uh, for the use of chocolate, one of which is Chinese. Also on the table is the uh, molinillo or stirrer in a chocolate cup of a mounted coconut shell. Uh, notice that the porcelain uh, chocolate cup is cracked, but still valued and used. And a word about the mansorinas, which is similar to a trombleuse, a saucer with a raised edge uh, to hold a, a cup. If the saucer has an attached openwork cup holder, then it's a mansorina, mansorina not a, a trombleuse. And a silver form would have served as the model for the Puebla potter, as it would have also served for the Chinese potter, because the Chinese potter has copied the uh, volutes of the silver very precisely. Uh, they were superb at copying uh, things. Um, and this just absolutely blows me away. Um, <coughs> I've never seen a copper enamel on copper uh, mansarina before, uh, and it's an absolute beauty. So. Congratulations to you for uh, acquiring that. Um, uh, many uh, porcelain services were made for Spanish clients in Spain and in the colonies, and most were polychrome opaque enamels, but relatively few were created with the owner's coats of arms. Uh, not in the exhibition, but it's the only one known, so I'm including it here is the earliest armorial for the Spanish market, uh, made for Garcia Hurtado de Mendoza, born in Spain in 1535. He is important to us in this story because he traveled to Peru in 1556 with his father, uh, 
who had been named the viceroy. At 22, he was appointed governor of Chile by his father. He later returned to Spain under a cloud, but was back in Peru in 1588 when he was appointed viceroy, a position he held in, until 1596. And speaking of, oh, he received a pardon from Philip II for his previous indiscretions. Uh, speaking of Philip II, these flasks with the arms of Castile and Leon are often known as Philip II bottles, uh, but there are no known affiliations with him. From the accepted dating of these, these could have belonged to Philip II, Philip III, or Philip IV. 18th century dinner services were common very and very large for noble families, generally running three to 500 pieces or more. This is a service for an American, but I'm including it as a visual clue as to the numbers of pieces that would have been in a particular service. Among the plates and other service pieces were common terrines for serving soups, sauces, and meat, of which you can see four examples here. More rare, far more rare, are the uh, terrines in the form of animals, which was a short-lived um, uh, production that is best as we can de determine for, uh, and from Chinese uh, sources, dates around 1765, when the Dutch East India Company ordered 25 boarhead terrines. You have one in the collection here on the first floor. And lasting until about 1800, when the last terrine for the Spanish market seems to have been ordered. R rarer still are those with coats of arms, all of which, it appears, were made only for the Spanish market. And most of those uh, made for the Spaniards were for Spaniards in the Philippines. Uh, the owner of these, these this is uh, a pair of carp terrines at, at PEM, and you have one here in the exhibition. Uh, and these belong to the first commissioner of the Royal Company of the Philippines in 1785, when it was established as a post, um, and he held that until 1797. Generally, orders would include the forms of a goose, a fish, an ox, a boar, or, and cockerels, each with a matching stand. This goose terrine was made for the Astaguieta family and may have been ordered by Pedro Lamberto de Astaguieta, uh, who settled in the Philippine Islands around 1742, where he became consul in 1773. The arms are, um, oh, that's the Astaguieta, sorry. Um, the arms are frequently taken from book plates, which would have been colored so that the enamelers would get the correct colors, an important part of the armorial device. Here you see a detail of the Astaguieta family arms. The animal terrines in this original service uh, included, this is Astaguieta, a rooster and a boar's head, seen here, and also a duck form. The remainder of the service included plates, platters, traditional terrines, jugs, salt cellars, candlesticks, small bowls, meat dishes, a barber bowl, cruet set, coffee cups and saucers, all of them decorated with the Astaguieta family arms. I don't think we want to consider this oddity an animal-shaped terrain, but uh, it's a great rarity, uh, and I couldn't resist including it, as it too is made for the Spanish market. The owner was a, was a Renaissance man, an important administrator, and one-time mayor of Madrid, with no direct connection to my knowledge so far to New Spain or the Philippines. And then jumping to commemoratives, because there is some in the exhibition that belong to uh, the ACM. Uh, Gill was a fascinating artist who designed over 25 medals for various municipalities, institutions, and individuals in New Spain to commemorate the 1788 enthronement of King Charles IV. Seven of those medals were used as a source for Chinese export uh, porcelain services. One of these was for La Ciudad Puebla de los Angeles. And I hope you are as impressed as I am with a Chinese enameler's ability to faithfully copy by hand in any enamels a silver coin onto an entire service of porcelain uh, and overglaze enamels at a very small scale, only inches uh, in diameter. 
And then I wanted to uh, basically discuss uh, one of the most important pieces that the ACM has in the field. Uh, and this is the uh, jar with the Augustinian arms. Uh, the main motif is the Augustinian arms, and on this there's little argument. Uh, Pem, I bought one for a Pem. There's only a few left. I forgot how many, but... Um, and when I acquired it, the design on the bottom, I think I have... No. Um, well, we can use this, too. The, the central design is the a Habsburg um, bifurcated eagle, um, and the bottom is supposed to be the Sacred Heart of Jesus pierced by arrows. Uh, the design was um, somewhat butchered by some of the Chinese uh, craftsmen, but that is, that's, the, um, that's the emblem. When I acquired my jar, I asked, what's the building on the top there? And everyone shrugged and said, um, it's just a building. Um, and I, I don't go by that. Um, I think there are, um, there are reasons for including just a building. Um, here's another associated plate uh, that's in the exhibition from, from PEM. Um, there's no records yet known to indicate the source of the order of these porcelain, and no shards. Where are the, where are the archaeologists when I need them? Uh, we need to find some shards that will tell us where these w were used, uh, but so far no shards have been found. The story is too long and complex to be uh, included in full here in the talk, but I've published more details explaining my theory elsewhere. And I'd like to talk about it because I want to be challenged. Um, what I'm saying here is a theory. Um, and I want, if anybody has any evidence or another theory, I want to hear about it. Um, so I looked at this, and I pondered about what it could be. And then it reminded me of a church I saw in Huatzingo on the way from Mexico City to Puebla. And it had a, a wall around it, and it had little pavilions on either end. And you went in and walked down, and in the center was this church with a belfry, of, uh, or not, a, not a single belfry. But, and I thought, that has to be, of course, this is your theory. This has to be <laughs> what it is. Um, so I started. Um, doing research on this. And um, uh, when I first uh, looked into these, they were initially said to have been made for a church in Macau. And I double-tracked that information to the source, asked the source, who was a friend of mine, where did you get that information? He said, somebody told me. Uh, I said, that's not enough. I need, I need proof. Um, uh, you probably all know about the... Um, the, the Augustinian arms in Manila, um, it, it was important. Um, it appears the, these were ordered in the East by Portuguese or Spanish uh, Augustinian friars, and in 1589 presented to the newly opened convent of Macau. That's what I heard. And I said, it appears. And um, I don't like that word. Um, you, you need some proof. So I did my research on this. Uh, there's a detail of, I think it's from our uh, piece. The architectural motif included uh, alternate panels on the charges and jars and associated plates. So there's Wei Hatsingo. No, is that Wei Hatsingo? Yeah, Wei Hatsingo. Um, could it be from a crude drawing made of something like this or some other church? I, I don't know. It's not the only church in Mexico that is surrounded by a wall, or probably in the Spanish Empire that's surrounded by a wall. Um, but my, ser my search led me to this print. After uh, a 1579 uh, publication, which implied that churches in New Spain more often than not followed this particular pattern. Looking at the image on the porcelain as um, an elevation or, or straight-on view of it, uh, of the compound, the central edifice could be the church with its espadaña, uh, the pierced, pierced vertical wall belfry of the facade, and the crenellations adjoining the roof line. Extending to either side would be the walls of the atrio or patio, the walled churchyard, and at each end of the roofs of, are two of the four corner shelters 
or fosas or chapels, uh, it was said that the atrio was a distinctive answer to the need in New Spain for a space to contain the crowds of local converts that couldn't fit in the church itself. This type of architecture was fairly common in New Spain, regardless of the religious order. Um, although the Espadaña is most often associated with Augustinian churches. It's a long, long story. Um, and uh, there are records about the riches of the church. One Augustinian monk wrote to Philip II, we have founded a large number of monasteries which reflect our tastes and customs, our rule and manner of life. The churches are adorned with bells, statues and retables, um, have musical instruments and organs in the choirs. The sacristies are filled with sil jewels, silver, and ornaments. So they they were they were richly decorated. Another letter um, to Philip II complained about quote the excesses that are here, evident in the buildings that are too sumptuous. So could these churches have held these porcelain? I think they obviously would have. In fact, um, now. The, uh, if you, I always want provenance for something. Um, and I've already discounted Macau as provenance. Uh, there's no archeological record. But the fact is that most of the vases that exist today have a provenance to Mexico. Most of them came out of Mexico. Um, there was one when I first wrote my uh, research paper that was in the Queens collection. I didn't have access to that information. Uh, so I wasn't sure when it came in or where it came from. Uh, the property of the church in Mexico was secularized in 1834, after which many of the churches were stripped of their most uh, valued treasures, helping to explain the lack of uh, documentation for the history of these pieces in Mexico, other than a few that hung around. Uh, when I first wrote about the jars, uh, that information wasn't available, but that piece has now been published it was in the Win Windsor Castle Inventory of 1866, which was just 32 years after the Mexican churches were secularized. So I think the timing even sort of helps to support, it doesn't confirm, but I think it helps to support that the piece arrived after it was taken out of a church in, in Mexico. Um, what do you do with, um, I'm very excited because I'm, I'm a little bit ahead, so uh, <laughs> I, I have something I want to share with you that's totally outside all of this. But what do you do with all these thousands of pieces of porcelain that get damaged over the centuries, that, um, uh, that are out of fashion? Uh, well, you make them into a fountain, uh, uh, which I haven't seen this yet, but I'm dying to, uh, the Fuente del Risco. Uh, which was begun in 1739 and 40, but it has plates, platters, cups, bowls, of porcelain from the Ming Dynasty, uh, blue and white Chinese porcelain from the 17th and 18th, Japanese Amari porcelain, Spanish Talavera, ceramics from Puebla, uh, ceramics from Germany and England, as well as shells and other stuff. Uh, this is a, I, I tried hard to find if anybody has published this, but somebody should do like they did with the Santos Palace in Madrid and uh, Lisbon do a uh, piece-by-piece explanation of all of this. So I have a few minutes, and I want to share something with you that's totally outside this, because although I'm talking about just Chinese sexual porcelain, I'm interested in everything. <laughs> uh, everything to do with the Manila galleon trade, every material, every everything. Um, and I was so excited to see the feather pictures in the exhibition, which are so rare. Uh, and I had the pleasure of hearing Clem give a lecture, and he talked about them, and he showed a detail of a map where the Wan, Wanli Emperor uh, remarked on the feather pictures. Um, this is like 16th century, R remark on the feather pictures. Um, I happened to be in Taiwan lecturing in uh, December, and they had an exhibition at the Na National Palace Museum there on global trade, um, where they talked about how one of the commodities brought from Mexico was corn, which was called imperial wheat. Um, and I also, I mentioned at the very beginning that the Spaniards got a foothold 
on the coast of China in the late 16th century, uh, but were pushed out by the Portuguese. Then they went to Formosa on the northern coast, uh, which is Taiwan, and they were kicked out by the Portuguese again. Um, but in order to get that right to go there, they must have gone to the imperial, to the emperor, and made some gifts, like a feather picture, like wheat, uh, imperial wheat. And this shocked me, an obsidian mirror uh, that's in the imperial collection. And they, the, the museum just kind of stumbled across it recently. Um, and they uh, said they did not have any information as to when it came into the collection. But as you can see, uh, the, Chen, the Qinlung Emperor wrote in praise of a black jade mirror. He thought it was jade. Um, and you, you can read the, and I'm not going to read it to you, but you can read what he wrote about it. Um, so I think my challenge, I have two challenges for the audience. One is to uh, uh, prove me wrong that the uh, jar is not for the Mexican market. Uh, and the other is to find the reference and more information about Spain's uh, uh, approach to the emperor uh, with their um, uh, treasures of feather pictures, corn, and an obsidian mirror. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. That was a wonderful talk, as always. Very interesting. Um, maybe I'll kick it off by trying to follow up on your challenge. If the Augustinian jars are made for Mexico, ordered by the Augustinians there, um, what was their motive in doing that? Did they want to commemorate their courtyard buildings with the towers? Did they have a special need? Did other orders in the Spanish world commission things relevant to those orders? How, how do you put this into a larger perspective? Why order these, these jars? We're still looking for the diary uh, that will explain everything to us. Um, <clears throat> um, that, as we know, the whole Manila Galleon trade was ordering stuff like the um, armorial um, from Peru, the, the medallion pieces. Um, yeah, everybody ordered, and they ordered armorials. Um, we, I had a challenge uh, yesterday to do an exhibition on Spanish armorials for the Mexican market. So uh, we have a lot of challenges going on here. Um, I, uh, there is, um, I, I spoke a long time ago, I think when I first spoke on this, and there was uh, Clara Bargellini uh, who was doing research in the missions. The missions ordered things. Um, I don't think she found anything from an Augustinian mission ordering these particular pieces. But she did have the actual paper records from the missions ordering certain things and then checking off that they received the things that they wanted. And these missions were in Mexico, what is now Mexico, but also went up the coast of what's California. Um, so but isn't this very early for a specific order? I mean, the Augustinian blue and whites are from the late 16th century. Right, right. Um, the galleon trade, as I understand it, at this point was basically buying stuff without special order. The vast bulk right. of the silks and right. the porcelain were things that were made for a generic market like right. frock and uh, undifferentiated silk. Right. Isn't this very early? Are it's we saying early. are we saying the Augustinians are innovators in this Spanish of world obsession <laughs> with <laughs> coats of arms? Yes. I mean, this is this is hundreds of years before the medals, right? Yes, 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 yes. But but so is that early that 16th century uh, blue and white uh, crock uh, armorial uh, from Mendoza in Peru. Um, right. So it happened, uh, but we have no record of how when how he ordered it. You know. Uh, 
that's the big mystery. Um, where our job is to fill in the details when we can, but I don't have all the answers. No. No. Well, I was expecting more, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice con it's a nice connection between a, a, a missionary order and private or aristocratic yeah. markets. Right. I mean, I think that's the uh, one of the interesting points you make. Yeah. Well, um, that was my question. So, what's your question, um, audience? I'll call on people if there, you don't. There's, uh, there's one. Ah, uh, <laughs> Uncle. Well, get, get, get a mic here. Yeah. We can hear your stuff. Yeah. I wanted to put in the table, of course, a, a very a funny thing regarding the specific these Agustinian jars. If you look at the palace of the Sultan of Ternate in the Maluku Islands, it has the same design, the eagle, the, the, eagle, the heart with the uh, arrows, and when I saw that, I was like, well, maybe the, it was a vehicle for diplomacy because the Augustinians, of course, were the main order to uh, push into the Philippines. Right. And so they could have been commissioned as gifts uh, from the Augustinians to, uh, of course, to Mexico and to other places. Because when I saw the, the design in the, in the palace of the Sultan in Ternate, it is the same, same, same. Uh, With a building on the top? Uh, uh, or, or the no, just just oh, yeah, uh, yeah. the the eagle with the heart and the and the and the things. Uh, but I think your theory is very interesting uh, with the Baladez uh, engraving from uh, Mexico City. I think more research has to be done, and as yes. you said, yes. eventually we'll find those charts and we'll call yeah. you okay, up. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so just that uh, little. Someone else there in the middle. I believe George Welsh, when he was writing about that particular piece, mentioned the possibility of it representing a symbolic city of God, the Augustinian city uh, of yes, God. Do you yes. buy that or not? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, it is totally not my field. Um, I presented this first at a conference in Denver at the Mayor Center, uh, which if, if you're interested in Mexican uh, Spanish colonial culture, uh, they have a a conference, I think every other year or something like that. Um, and um, I would say half the audience came up to me and said, you're absolutely right. And the other half came up and said, you're absolutely wrong. Uh, it's the city of God. Um, and so I had not explored that. And I didn't do a deep dive because I had already published the thing. But I did do some research. And I could not find a depiction, there are many depictions of the city of God. Um, they are all uh, round um, walled cities with buildings going, Domes. you know, piled up high. Uh, none of them are a flat building like that. So um, I'm not convinced that it's the city of God. Um, yes? Contextually, there's no connection to other no. representations of the city of God. There's no. really none. I mean, I think you really make the point. And it has to be specifically related to the Augustinians in some way. It's right? definitely Augustinian. Um, and I'm perfectly open to any interpretation or whatever. Um, I'll, I'll sort of like defend my, uh, my using a shard uh, thing. But there is another design of a plate which we have, a magnificent plate with a seven-headed uh, hydra. Um, and the seven-headed hydra is used everywhere by everybody. I mean, it's been around forever. However, the one on the plate, the Chinese plate, has two human heads. The only place I've ever seen one of these with two human heads is on the facade of St. Peter's in uh, Macau, or Paul, 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 Paul. St. Paul's in Macau, uh, in bas relief, great big um, uh, thing with two human heads. Um, and I went to Macau to try to find some connection with not that piece, but I was initially doing the um, Augustinian jar. And I went to the museum. And I said, do you have a shard of anything with this design on? And they said, no. And I said, oh, OK. Do you have one with this design? And they said, yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, that, that piece was, in fact, made for Macau. I'm convinced now that's made from and for the church there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 
Clement in the front row. <laughs> in the middle of the front row. Thanks, Bill, for the lecture. Have you found anything more about the mystery lines with the merry-go-round motif? No. no, 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 no. I have no clue what that is. None whatsoever. Just to give a context, on one of the plates that are in the show are these things that look like a carousel, a yeah, merry-go-round. It and it's one of the most fascinating things, like a ponies going around. Actually, there are lions going around a merry-go-round. I think it's proof of extraterrestrial visits. <laughs> When you publish an article, I'd like to have a PDF of it. I will send it to you. One more, way in the back there. I, I have something for you. I don't think it's a shard, a shard, Bill. <laughs> or it is going to be a bigger problem for you in the future. So you can see that there was like five arts there, no? Like the five pavilions like structures there. Right, right. Yeah, so in Madrid, in 1620s, they finished a building for the Augustinians in the place where actually is the National Library and the Museum of Archaeology. And it was called the Palace of Copacabana. It was the place where the Augustinians were uh, prepared before they go to America. Uh, and it have, it have that art at the, at the beginning. Nowadays, they, uh, we have only engravers. But if you want, I can provide them to you. Yes, yes, I'd like to see that. Um, uh, we, I didn't get into this because I have 20, 19 seconds. Um, but I would like to, I would like to uh, pursue that. Um, the, the other kind of quirky thing about these jars, <clears throat> I think uh, the jar here and my jar are very similar. But there's actually a series of jars, and some of them are round, some of them are slightly faceted, some of them are small, some of them are big, um, some of them are better quality. Uh, so it implies that this isn't one single order uh, that happened, you know, I, I want 20 jars of different sizes. Um, it implies that something else went on, but without documentation, we're only left to guess. It's a bigger mystery. It's a bigger mystery, it's a bigger yeah. Mystery. yeah. Order yeah. over several. It could have been ordered over several, several decades. Uh, it could have been ordered by different, um, I, I don't know. Different orders. I just don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you very much. We're um, out of time. Um, a round of applause for Bill. That's one. <laughs>
uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Asian Civilizations Museum and especially Clement Ong for this invitation. I'm honored to be here. Between the late 16th and the late 18th centuries, the lacquer phenomenon was extraordinarily diverse in New Spain. Starting in the 1570s, the trade between Manila and Acapulco made possible that different kinds of Asian lacquers were known and became popular in New Spain. Um, decades later, when the Europeans developed their own lacquer techniques, that trade with Spain assured the circulation of European lacquer pieces as well. Um, yes. Moreover, Mexican colonial artists made their own contributions, which included enconchados, that is, paintings inlaid with model of pearl, as well as lacquer-like painted folding screens. Objects made with techniques of pre-Columbian origin and some others inspired by European chinoiserie. These works not only circulated regularly in New Spain, but they were also collected by Spanish viceroys and sent as gifts to Spain. For this reason, to better understand the true scope of the world lacquer phenomenon between the 16th and the 18th centuries, it is paramount to delve into the Mexican colonial case whose heterogeneity is little known out of the Spanish-speaking world. In the early 16th century, Spanish friars and chroniclers were impressed by chicales, that is, glasses, bowls, and personal adornments made of calabashes, which they described as painted, while they were actually made with a mix resulting from the fat of the insect aje, chia and chicalote oil, and powder minerals which provided them with brilliant colors, and at the same time made them very resistant. Moctezuma, the Aztec ruler of Tenochtitlan, ate and drank from these treated calabashes. Their beauty astonished the Europeans who wrote that they were so luxurious that they were equal to European silver crockeries. In the early colonial time, there was no specific word to name this kind of works, which would be called paintings, varnishes, or calabashes because they were beautiful and not especially associated with worship, the Spaniards did not cut off their making. On the contrary, they ordered pieces for their own consumption, which included different kinds of wooden furniture that were not uh, used in pre-Columbian time. Objects from the 16th century are lost, but documentary information reveals that they were simply described as painted objects from certain towns. These works were totally unrelated to Asian lacquerware and probably included both pre-Columbian and European motifs and designs. Prior to the arrival of the Spaniards, treated calabashes had been made in the largest part of Mesoamerica or pre-Columbian Mexico. But already in the 16th century, Regional production centers were limited to a few sites in Guerrero, Chiapas, and especially Michoacán, where the Bishop Vasco de Quiroga, oh, oh sorry, that was a uh, Guerrero, oh sorry, oops, <laughs> uh, oops, I want to go back, uh, yes, okay. Um, Michoacán, where the bishop Vasco de Quiroga had encouraged the making of technically Indian rooted works that were adapted to the lifestyle imported by the Spaniards. Cornstalk cane sculpture, featherwork, and processed calabasas and wooden objects are the most outstanding exemplars of this phenomenon in Michoacán. Since the colonial making of the latter started developing decades before the local population first knew Asian lacquer, many regional lacquer pieces are totally foreign 
to the Japanese and Chinese ones. Things started to change in the 17th century. By then, Japanese number lacquer was circulating not only in Mexico City, but also in other cities of New Spain, as demonstrated by documentary references from Acapulco, Colima, Puebla, and Zacatecas. Because the first Asian lacquers to be known locally were made with Japanese maquille technique, the word maque was introduced into Mexican Spanish to refer to lacquer. Over time, maque was also used, the word, to name Mexican pieces, as well as Chinese lacquer. Different kinds of Mexican works inspired by Asian lacquer um, and European lacquer. The lacquer phenomenon in New Spain is better understood if we study separately the 17th and the 18th centuries. In both cases, lacquer were involves different techniques, production centers, and kinds of works. But the phenomenon is especially diverse during the 1700s. Mexican lacquer was permanently evolving, and this can be seen even if only studying Asian-related works. In the 17th century, the model was the Japanese lacquerware. Mm, okay. While in the 18th century, it was the Chinese one along with European chinoiserie. But models apart, it was the Chinese one, uh, uh, sorry, models apart, both novo Hispanic artists and patrons were undoubtedly proud of their own works, which were exported to Spain to be offered as gifts through the 1600s and the 1700s. Regardless of lacquer techniques, the kind of colonial art objects that were given away were carefully chosen for the novelty of their iconography, design, or as in this case, for their technique. For uh, works that were very similar to European art would seldom be exported. For this reason, while having a large domestic market, many outstanding Mexican lacquer pieces were sent to Spanish collections during colonial time. Here, we will first discuss the 17th century, when New Spain's lacquer world mainly consisted of Japanese Namban lacquer, as well as Perivan's work, and Enconchados. By the second half of the 16th century, the Portuguese and the Jesuits settled in southern Japan, which gave place to new artistic productions, mainly painted folding screens and lacquer objects, currently known as Namban. This term means southern barbarians, and it was used by the Japanese to refer to the Catholic foreigners that came to Japan. Same as domestic lacquer of the period, Namban lacquer had black backgrounds and designs consisting of foliage and autumn flowers outlined with powder gold. It was made through polishing layers of urushi lacquer. Namban lacquer is distinguished by model of pearl inlaid figures and the use of western forms such as lecterns, boxers, cabinets and chests. Japanese lacquer circulated in New Spain from the opening of the Manila-Acapulco trade route in 1573, but its presence must have grown significantly in 1610, when a group of 23 Japanese came to New Spain accompanying Rodrigo de Vivero, former governor of the Philippines, who had been helped to return by the shogun Tokugawa Ieyasu after having been shipwrecked in Japan. Soon after, members of the Keisho Embassy also passed through Mexico in 1614 on their way to Europe to meet, to meet King Philip III and Pope Paul V. Little is known about these embassies, but since Western taste for Japanese lacquer was then at its peak, they undoubtedly brought lacquer pieces to New Spain. Most collections in Mexico had lost a large part of their portable possessions, and therefore evidence of Namban lacquer is scarce. A noteworthy exception is an altar with images of the Virgin of Guadalupe, the Mexican one, 
which was sent from New Spain to Spain in 1786. Otherwise, the circulation of non-banlacan in Mexico was largely connected to private individual and individuals and institutions. Perhaps for these reasons, Japanese lacquer could be as cheap as five pesos, while the most expensive pieces could command as much as 800 pesos. Although Japanese lacquer had the reputation of being of the highest quality, Father Joao Rodriguez wrote in 1622, after long years in Japan, when he learned to speak the language fluently, that Japanese lacquer was splendid, but very costly, and that there was a second class which looked similar, but was of lower workmanship, loss, and price. Rodriguez also reported that there were fakes which can easily deceive someone who does not know much about it. Because the taste for Asian objects quickly disseminate, disseminated in New Spain, it is possible that inexpensive Japanese lacquer objects recorded in documents correspond to the fakes mentioned by Rodriguez. In Enconchado's frames and borders, the resemblance to Japanese Namban lacquer is easily seen. Enconchado frames usually have black backgrounds against a display of unnaturalistic yet very detailed flowers, leaves, and grape clusters. Figures are usually outlined in black and painted in gold. Model of pearl inlays cut from the shiny inner surface of mollusks tend to be irregularly shaped. Frames and scenes were made with the same technique. In the scenes, fragments of mother of pearl are inlaid in the areas corresponding to the character's clothing, as well as portions of the architecture and landscape. The coating over the mother of pearl consists of a mixture of oil, varnish, and possibly tempera adapted to enhance the natural sheen of the mother of pearl. In the best works, painting is applied in translucent layers so that the shiny surface can be easily seen at a short distance. High quality enconchados were prized for their luminosity. We do not know how and when enconchados were first made. The Gonzalez family specialized in this kind of painting in the late 17th century. A document of 1689 calls Tomás González a master of lacquer painting, and his son Miguel González a journeyman of that art. No works signed by Tomás González is known to exist. He had several children, but only the eldest, Miguel, born in 1666, six, and Juan, born in 1675, became enconchado painters. Both worked in the 1690s and the early 700s. Between the 1690s and the 1730s, other painters also made enconchados, but the Gonzaleses appear to be the only ones who work solely with this technique, which may have first developed in the workshop of their father, Tomás. Enconchados were often made for the open market, although the best known works are series of high quality and the pick, which depict historical or religious scenes. One of Miguel González's most outstanding signed works is a series depicting the allegories on the Christian rift. This is the only series to have remained in Mexico since its production. It consists of 12 panel paintings with beautiful enconchado frames. They depict scenes from the lives of the Virgin and Christ. Unusually, each painting is captioned with an apostle's name, for example, Matthew, for the Last Judgment. The originality of Gonzalez's work is more clearly seen on the frames, which show an intricate design of flowers, birds, and leaves painted on gold, in gold, inlaid with mother of pearl, and with touches of red against the black background. While most enconchado frames share similar features, 
they were conceived individually and show deliberate variations. The palette of enconchados is relatively restricted. Red and green are used liberally, but blue is avoided, probably to avoid obscuring the luminosity of the mother of pearl. Pieces of mother of pearl are inlaid in a small, irregular, but shiny fragments, both in the scenes and the frames. While technically unrelated, featherwork and enconchados attest to the same taste for luminosity and an ability to take non-Western works and materials as a starting point for something new. The fact that enconchado frames are present in most high-end works let us affirm that the taste for these paintings largely related to frames, which in turn suggests that the taste for Nanban lacquer in New Spain was key in the development of enconchados. The Guild of Painters ordinances did not mention frames. Nonetheless, the fact that the Gonzaleses play very, paid very close attention to them ultimately reveals that the audience had a strong taste for enconchado frames. That taste for enconchados extended into the 1730s. However, the latest information about the Gonzaleses dates from 1704, and later enconchados would likely have been the work of different painters. A few works exist that are signed by Nicolas Correa, Agustin del Pino, Pedro López Calderón, and a certain Rodolfo. We have little information on these artists, but some of them were skilled painters, as can be seen in a version of Guadalupe by Agustin del Pino. Pino was probably active between the 1690s and 1710s. Interestingly, this work avoids the color blue, although it is the color of Virgin's mantle. Mother of Pearl is inlaid in irregular shades of around 3 centimeters, which tend to form most of Guadalupe's cloth. The frame is small, but it displays a black background, covered by gold and shell inlaid flowers, birds, and grape clusters, which demonstrates that Pino was familiar with the main features of Enconchados. In other words, once the Gonzalez workshop established the genre's main features, other artists were able to follow to meet their customers' expectations. Unlike Enconchados, Mexican lacquer of the 17th century was made in small towns, mainly in Michoacán. The most important one is Peribán. Works included large trays and coffers and are recognizable for their carved designs and powder pigments to inlay in the excise sections. Designs are based on mannerist prints, prints but are sometimes hard to identify because of the dense decoration which is totally unrelated to Asian lacquer. Interestingly, Perivan lacquer was already being exported in the first half of the 17th century, as demonstrated by a bowl included in a still life by the Spanish painter Antonio de Pereda, dated in 1648. Now we go to the, uh, to the 18th century. By then, lacquer world was even more diverse in colonial Mexico. Other regional lacquer production centers flourish, each producing works with distinctive features. Perhaps the most famous was lacquer from Patsuero, which was also the closest to chinoiserie designs. The most famous artist to make these works was José Manuel de la Cerda in the mid-18th century. In 1763, the Spanish prior Ajofrin wrote that de la Cerda was making a dozen of trays for the vice-rey Marchioness of Ruilas. At least one of these pieces has been preserved. The tray shows de la Cerda's signature, which is a true exception since even famous painters would often leave their works unsigned. According to Ajofrin, de la Cerda's work was better than Chinese lacquer. It is likely that, more than an individual opinion, 
Ahofrin was sharing the general perception about De La Cerda. We do not know for sure if Mexican lacquer pieces from the 17th century uh, were shipped to Spain as gifts or ordered by Spanish patrons. In the case of De La Cerda's work, the Marchioness of Truillas would undoubtedly have access to good Chinese lacquer pieces. So the fact that she ordered trays from De La Cerda's workshop demonstrates that she had a very high opinion of his work which would be far from being a second-class substitution for Chinese originals. Interestingly, some of the best Pascual lacquer pieces do not follow Chinese models, but rather European chinoiserie. In fact, De La Cerda knew Sayers and Stockram Parker's lacquer treatises. While 17th century enconchados related directly with Japanese lacquer, 18th century lacquer from Pazcuaro was following European models, but the audience was not comparing these works with chinoiserie, but with Chinese originals. There are other proofs of the impacts of European lacquer in 18th century Mexico. The most relevant are documentary references to clocks signed by the English artist Ellicott, as well as musical instruments signed by different artists. Works listed on those documents are unfortunately lost, but they reinforce the idea that wealthy Mexicans of the 1700s had access to a world of possibilities in matter of lacquerware. The fact that they commissioned objects to regional workshops says a lot about the high esteem they had for local productions. Another important production center of Mexican lacquer from the 18th century is Olinala in Guerrero. This production is easy to recognize for its brilliant orange, which would often be combined with blue, deep red, and white. The Manila Dalian exhibition includes an interesting box made in Olinala, whose exterior is elaborately decorated with figures, flowers, and a variety of animals. The technique is known as rayado, which involves coating a surface with two layers of pigmented varnish, then scratching away the upper layer to reveal a design. Skilled artists would be, were able to create pieces with three or more colors. Interestingly, in Olinala, the fat of the insect aje seems not to have been used, which demonstrates that, regardless of the pre-Columbian origin, local techniques continued to change throughout colonial time. The painting on the inside cover of this piece is a mystery. It does not use the rayado technique, but it has a single layer of pigmented varnish. Many Mexican lacquer pieces which have an elaborate outer design are not decorated on the inner part, so this work must have been particularly appreciated. The inscription states that the box was to be used for elections and was presented by Sister uh, Maria Ana of José Ruiz de la Mota in 1779. That is to say, this work was a special order, which confirms the appreciation for the Olinala work at the end of the colonial period. Now, folding screens were one of the most important Chinese lacquer production in 18th century New Spain. By that time, Chinese Coromandel lacquer screens widely circulated in Europe, where they would often be disassembled to use their panels on walls or furniture decoration. Interestingly, it was other kind of Chinese lacquer screens which circulated more in New Spain. They didn't have relief. Um, while some of them were black, they often had crests on top of each leaf and less than 12 leaves. These works were a model for Mexican folding screens. However, local artists always introduced some changes, like adding golden clouds borrowed from Japanese lacquer, uh, no, painted, painted folding screens, or pairing these depictions with totally unrelated painted scenes, like the conquest of Mexico. This is on the other side of the same screen. In the 1700s, 
red lacquer was very popular both in Spain and New Spain. This includes, in the latter case, Chinese screens, some of which were rodastrados, that is, low folding screens placed on a raised platform for women, which indicates that the works were adapted to the Spanish-American market. Original works are lost, but some Mexican screens imitating them have been preserved, including those which have crests on top. Because Spanish-American market was very large, it makes sense that it contributed to shaping some part of the Chinese lacquer production. While little is known on this topic, there is no doubt that Manila played a leading role on this respect. Moreover, the Mexican audience was as fond of Chinese-style art as it was of original Chinese solutions. Several red lacquer or lacquer-like Mexican folding screens have survived to this day. Some of them depict scenes totally inspired by chinoiserie. In other cases, the resemblance with Chinese lacquer is evident on the red background, as well as the inclusion of a few figures, like birds, whose long tails and wings remind Feng Shuan's. These folding screens were ordered by patrons who also owned Chinese folding screens, and over time developed a taste for works that were only slightly inspired by Asian originals. Technical studies on Mexican lacquer and lacquer-like folding screens are yet to be done, but the diversity of solutions suggests that they were made in different workshops. It is likely that some of them were made with regional lacquer techniques, some others following European procedures, and yet others with painting techniques. The works we have discussed in this paper attest to the extraordinary success, success of lacquer in colonial Mexico. While such, a sex, such success was strongly encouraged by the Manila Galleon, it was also fueled by the ability to transform pre-Columbian taste and knowledge, and over time, integrate European lacquer as well. Throughout the time of the trade via the Manila Galleon, Mexico continued to import Asian lacquerware. The scarce evidence suggests that many lacquer pieces circulating in New Spain were shaped to meet local taste. Little attention has been paid to the fact that European lacquer also played a role on the 18th century Mexican lacquer spectrum. But far from passively receiving foreign lacquer, New Spain also exported its own lacquer productions, which were appreciated by relevant patrons out of New Spain. Moreover, 18th century New Spain likely was a place of the world where lacquer was more heterogeneous and diverse. The fact that colonial Mexico had direct trade routes with Asia via Manila and Europe via Spain was key to maintain the vice royalty permanently up to date. But there was more to a privileged position. Ultimately, the thriving force for the high quality and large quantity of lacquer war in colonial Mexico was the strong will of patrons and artists to innovate and follow a path of their own, whose individuality is remarkable if we consider how strongly tied it was to other lacquer phenomena of that time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sonia. That was terrific. Um, it's an interesting idea of seeing Mexico as a linchpin between Asia and Europe, and of course Europe having its own separate response to Asian chinoiserie. It's an, a nice overview and a balancing of, of this whole system of lacquer and you know whether it's 
urushi, whether it's uh, varnishes, whether it's uh, insect-based lacquer, you have many different techniques all coming together. And I like the way you distinguish technique from imagery. Um, I'm, I'm going to start off with a question on the classical enconchado, the 17th and 18th century, because the Japanese examples have a um, mother of pearl and gold with um, foliage and birds. And this is adapted into the frames of the, of the Mexican examples. But somehow the paintings themselves also take up the tinted varnish, the black backgrounds, and especially the mother of pearl. Whereas uh, Japanese paintings, and we'll hear about that later today, the paintings are purely oil and tempera in the Asian examples. So how do, how do you think that Mexico took the lacquer techniques and put them into the figural Christian paintings, which is something that are, are, I think didn't exist in Asia at all. How did that happen, do you think? I wish I could answer that question. <laughs> Uh, the thing is that we do not know the earliest examples of this phenomenon. Um, most likely, uh, early works are all lost. And of course, there, there must have been an experimental period, you know, probably, most likely, uh, uh, because of Tomas Gonzalez. And what I think is that maybe it developed more or less slowly. I mean, most likely, um, I mean, there was a market for uh, Japanese uh, lacquer in New Spain, but after the, uh, the ban, the banning of Christendom, and then after Japan closed itself off, um, well, people didn't have access. I mean, well, a very few group of privileged people in Manila, they did, they did via China. Mm. But anyway, there was a taste uh, in New Spain, and I think that it might have started as an imitation but then, something that is very beautiful about um, Mexican uh, colonial uh, phenomena, I mean, I'm, I'm not only speaking of Asian-related or Asian-inspired phenomena, is that uh, I think that it, this started in the early 16th century when the Spaniards first came, because we have very early wonderful examples of feather work, for oh, example, oh. and also, well, I, I show uh, just uh, um, one, one image of each, but the, um, the um, oh my God, I forgot the, um, the English word for the sculpture, the, the stock cane um, sculpture, pasta mm -hmm. de caña, the maize. Mm -hmm. And um, well, and of course, like regional lacquers, the ones that are not related, that were early examples of the making now for the Spaniards, right? So I think there was something that was developed, developing since the, 18, the, the 16th century, before, before the uh, Manila Galleon trade started, that may, I, I don't think it depends so much on the artists. Of course, there, there were very skilled artists, but no matter how skilled the artist might be, they need, of course, a market. And what I think is that a uh, local market was, well, maybe in the very, very early cases, I mean, 16th century, it was fooled by the, the, the friars, you know? The friars were always um, requiring images, n new images, and then also people who were Spanish people who were temporarily in New Spain, and then they came back to Spain. And they came back with works that were different to the European ones. But then I think that it also relied a lot in, in local population, mm. in local taste, mm. uh, because that's something very nice in New Spain. I mean, in the 16th century, but also in the 18th century, you have very wealthy people, people who have many Chinese, European works. But anyway, they seem to really like um, some Mexican productions. So, so even people with international taste want to have Mexican enconchado. Yes. A and it's really a kind of unique local form, you know, based on many sources. But mm -hmm. maybe, as you're saying, I even mm -hmm. based on feather work, is that possible? Is that what you're saying? Oh, no, sorry. I, I, I just, <laughs> I, I forgot to write you there, but yes, you were very specific. A comparison with the work, yeah. Yes, yes. Ah. No, um, well, because they share luminosity. No, 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 they are totally right. unrelated in technique, in, in production centers. No, sorry, no, totally unrelated. But they do share, uh, a, you know, like a bright, a no. very beautiful, a stunning bright. And, um, well, the early stages, 
as I mentioned, of enconchados, we, we can only speculate about them. I think that it might have started as copies, copies of number lacquer pieces, but then at some point by the 1650s or 50 or 1660s, once number lacquer production had stopped and there were no new works as a model, I think that people started, I mean, local people like liking, um, I don't know, like, hey, I mean, because sometimes triplics, lampal triplics, like, like the mm -hmm. one that is exhibited here, and um, somehow it frames a picture. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I think that was what this uh, technique developed, but you are right. I mean, the, the scenes themselves are totally a new thing. Totally new. Totally new, yes. Yeah. Thank you. You know, it's a, it's a fascinating subject. Um, questions from the audience, please, for Sonia. Um, up there, left aisle. Thank you, Dr. Chong. Uh, Sonia, I, I have a question, not so much about lacquer, but the forms taken by some of those lovely screens that you showed. And I noticed that the tops of them, mm -hmm. some of them have rounded arches. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's a relationship between the architectural structure on the blue and white ceramics that William Sargent was uh -huh. talking about <laughs> <laughs> or not? Would either of you like to comment on that? Um, I don't know, but it, it appears so often. But actually, they appear, they are very late. They are from the uh, 18th century. So, I mean, as much as I just love, love Bill's presentation, <laughs> I think there's a, a large gap between the two <laughs> phenomena. Yes. Another question, please. Thank you for the uh, very fascinating presentation. Um, Dr. Chong uh, uh, is quite right to draw attention to the Enconchados. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, uh, it's one of the highlights of the exhibit, uh, yes. a revelation, in fact. I just want to ask if Mexico has any source of Madre de Perla, Mother of mm -hmm. Pearl, or if this was something that really st only happened with the Galleon. For, uh, from Southeast Asian waters. We in Southeast Asia, of course, mm -hmm. uh, know that Mother of Pearl is endemic, Pintada Maxima. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, this was, just wanted to confirm if this was something totally coterminous with the galleon trade mm -hmm. uh, when it started and of course when it ended. Mm -hmm. And what happened to the Enconchado artisans uh, after mm -hmm. uh, the galleon trade uh, ended? Yes, thank you. Well, I like very much to speak about the, 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 the work, the, the, um, the, the, the show. Uh, actually, well, most culture in the world have show productions, show objects, show related artistic productions. Comes as no surprise because all, all what you need is a mollusk near you. And uh, actually, um, show work was very important in pre Columbian Mexico, very important, and especially in Tenochtitlan. But it, the phenomenon seems to be totally unrelated to Enconchados because um, it was not shawl or mother of pearl. There were specific kinds of shawl that were rela related specifically to Quetzalcoatl mm -hmm. or to other deities. So that part was totally stopped by the Europeans mm -hmm. because they, that was idolatry, right? And Enconchados start much longer after that. So um, the thing is that there was very easy to get shawls in Mexico City and in Mexico in general, because you have kilometers and kilometers, thousands of kilometers of um, sea coast. Of, yes, mm -hmm. of sea coast. <laughs> and there are there is well, there are a couple of references from the Jesuits from California, um, mentioning shells, and especially you know because they were fishing pearls in California. And one of these, Miguel del Barco, he says that all the um, mother of pearl was left I mean, all alone in the beach nobody uh, would use it. So, and of course, in the Philippines and in Asia, there's a you know, large uh, production of Mother of Pearl. But what I think is that they were simply using um, any, any show that they had in hand. One question here in the middle. Yes, there. One, one more. Someone in the middle? I thought I saw a hand. Yeah? yeah there. We have time for one more. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Can we go back to okay. a question on LACA? Um, may I know a little bit about the the workshops and who runs them, who did the designs, and was there any import of foreign talent from Japan or China? Or? Uh, specifically speaking of Enconchados and De Gonzalez, that is a possibility because we don't know anything about this family and it seems that the production was very, very um, related to them. I mean, it did continue a few decades after, I mean, the, the Yen Conchado that is on this exhibition was made by another painter, Agustin del Pino. But anyway, Yen Conchados had a short life, unlike other lacquer Mexican productions. And so, anyway, I think that is, I mean, we just don't have the information. I mean, the Gonzaleses might have a, a, a Japanese background, but they may not have a Japanese background. I mean, anyway, uh, Tomas Gonzalez, um, we don't know when he was born, but probably he was born in New Spain. And there is no proof that there was a Japanese community over time. I mean, people were always uh, mixing. So I don't really think that there was, I mean, it's not impossible, but anyway, I think that regardless of the early stages of the phenomenon, the development and the peak of it is, well, to me, the possibility that they were would be uh, of, of Japanese origin doesn't, I mean, I don't think that's uh, the most important question because anyway, the differences with the Japanese original works is evident and, and in, term, in terms of technique, they are totally unrelated. Thank you very much, a great talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker. Um, Kojima Yoshie is a professor at Waseda University in Tokyo, and she works on uh, Japanese Christianity in all of its complexity. She's written on uh, Fumie, the trampled images of the hidden Christians, and she contributed really a wonderful article uh, for the catalog on um, Japanese Christian paintings and their circulation through Macau and possibly Manila and the copies that were made along the way, a fascinating, a fascinating subject. So, uh, Yoshie? Uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to be here. Really, thank you so much, especially all of the Asian Spiritual Museum, especially Clement Ong and Heinrich Foundation and uh, Mexican Embassy. Thank you so much. Now I read my paper. I hope my Japanese English pronunciation can be comprehensive. Okay, I read. In Nagasaki, around 1590, the Italian Jesuit painter Giovanni Cola founded a Seminario dos Pintores, literally a seminary of painters, as it was called in contrary account. The disciples of this art school produced numerous paintings, including secular ones that demonstrate an acquaintance with Western painting. Because of the persecution of Christians in Japan, Kola of some of his disciples were forced to, in 1614, to flee to Macau, where he died 12 years later. The works of art produced by this school very likely survived not only in Japan, but also in Macau and Manila. Today, I would like to focus on the works of this school to see how certain specific religious images in Europe after the Council of Trent, held from 1545 to 63, were received, acculturated, and transformed. None of Giovanni Cora's works has been identified except for a small drawing Salvatore Mundi, which I found in his signed letter written in Macau in 1582, before he left on his mission to Nagasaki. Perhaps the best known of Kola's disciples was Chinese-Japanese painter Jacob Niwa, called Ni Yi Chen, 
in China. This old painting on copper, signed and dated 1597, is now in the Tokyo University Library. The painting shows that Miwa had truly absorbed Korea's Western style of painting, despite some awkwardness in the representation of detailed like hands. While many Korea's other disciples have remained anonymous, some artists can be identified, for in instance, the Madonna of the Snow, a delicate image in watercolors on traditional Japanese paper, differs substantially from New Salvador Mundi in that the facial features are more clearly defined and the eyes are larger. Similar features are found in Western kings on horseback and another group with stylistic um, uh, and um, sorry. another group with, with stylistic similarities includes European Zhang Xin, Western monk and two children, and women play, playing viola. Some of the faces depicted in this group are delicate and upturned with a particular expression and small pupils. Despite the differences within color school paintings, it is possible to recognize certain common de denominators such as thin, arched eyebrows, subtle and small folds, and delicate tonalities. These characteristics must have been derived from Kora's own work, not only because he was founder of the art school, but also because he was the first Western painter to arrive in Japan. Existing scholarship has investigate, investigated the career of Kola exclusively through Jesuit documents. We know that he was born around 1558 in Nolan, in the part of the Kingdom of Naples. In December 1577, he entered the Jesuit novitiate, and after only four years, he was sent to Japan. By way of Goa, Malacca, and Macau, he arrived in Nagasaki in July 1582. After spending some time there, he began to teach painting, and he soon had enough disciples to continue a veritable art school. The art seminary became very active after 1590. Even though civil wars in Japan forced it to relocate several times around Nagasaki, the Japan disciples of Seminario did not create original artworks, but forcefully copied Western art, mainly engravings. And in many cases, the images were a patchwork of multiple engravings, like Spanish colonial art at the time. Kola apparently proved to be an effective teacher. In 1594, the Jesuit Pedro Gomez reported of the dis disciples' paintings, quote, with most perfect perfections in color and likeness. So afterwards, among fathers and brothers, many could not distinguish which was the one they made and which had to be made in Japan and which had to be made in Rome, unquote. Kola was approximately 19 years old when he entered the Society of Jesus. In Renaissance Italy, it was common to begin an art apprenticeship around the age of 12 or 13. So by the time he entered the society, he may have the age of, uh, may have received artistic training. I believe he was trained in workshop of Giovanni Bernardo Lama, who was active in the second half of the 16th century. Like Kola, Lama was from Nola, and he is known to have a large workshop in Naples with numerous assistants and disciples. The characteristics of Lama's work and his workshop align with those of Kola's school, not only in terms of the subtle brush work and the soft tonality of colors, but also in regard to a certain weakness in the drawing and modeling of figures. The Archangel of Michael holding a monstrous, that will be discussed later, somewhat may resemble the works of Lama. 
as seen in the delicate folds of the clothing and the decorative motifs and in gold. These rather archaic decorations in gold were common in the Habsburg controlled domains of both so called old and new worlds, including Naples. The warm tonality and delicate and graceful expression of features and gestures were characteristics of Lama and his workshop. Distinct from the muscular expression of the human body and strong tonality of the cutting edge, then very popular Tuscan painters, Giorgio Vasari and Marco Pino, who also worked in Naples around the same time. It is possible that this Neapolitan style found a radio reception in East Asia, as its soft colors and delicate brushwork has similar feeling to the ink wash and watercolor painting that was prevalent in China and Japan at the time. Works by color the school exhibit parallels to Asian art, for example, the blank backgrounds which also appear in Chinese and Japanese paintings. Some figures convey an artificial, artificial expression, likely a result of the fact that class disciples never saw Westerners in everyday Western clothes or scenery, not to mention Western women or classical statues in Roman armor. As for the works of Kola's disciples in the East Pacific region, I will first focus on the Archangel Michael in Macau. Archive records, archival records indicate that the Archangel Michael was executed for the Jesuit Church of St. Paul in Macau, constructed in the first decades of the 17th century. The annual letter from the Macau College in 1608 state, states that a gilded altar panel bearing the image of Saint Michael has been placed in the church in the previous year. Um, year. However, Kola and his disciples did not arrive in Macau until 1614. Um, Based on an analysis of the dates, Cesar William Nunez suggests that Kola's disciple Jacob Niwa painted this work. Niwa's painting skill had become known among Jesuits in China, including Matteo Ricci. Niwa was called to Macau to work for the Church of St. Paul around 1600 and returned again in 1606. The attribution of the painting to Niwa becomes all the more likely when he compare, when we compare the Archangel Michael with the newest signed Salvador Mundi. Both show the same characteristics, shape of the ears and eyelids lines, as well as the same awkward designs of the hands. The iconography of the Archangel Michael holding a monstrance is very unusual. Michael rarely holds a monstrance, while behind the oval crystal is re a representation of the crucifixion. As has been argued quite extensively, the iconography of St. Michael has, been, has strong counter-reformation connections, as the militant archangel represents the battle against Protestant, in, Protestant heretics in Europe and pagans in Asia and the New World so to speak, new world. The subject of M Michael displaying the body of Christ can be linked to the doctrine of the transubstantiation, which was confirmed by the Council of Trent in 1551. While the images of Saint Michael were frequently produced, an image of the Saint, Saint Michael with the Eucharist is e extremely unusual I had found only two other paintings depicting this iconographic scene, both of which were executed in Mexico in the 18th century. 
wrong by Dominique's campaign that Pedro Gomez Guisunum was created well after the painting in Macau. The Saint Michael by Guisunum and that in Macau may have been based on the same print. In contrast to these Mexican versions, in Archangel Michael of Macau, the chain hanging from the Montrance is not attached to the dragon, but falls on a square object that likely indicates a seal of the abyss. According to the Book of Revelation, an angel with a key and a great chain put the debris in bounds in the abyss for a thousand years. The presence of the painting Archangel Michael holding a Montrance in Macau has significance because the city served as the center of the exchange in the trading network that extended to Nagasaki and Manila. Moreover, a very similar representation of Archangel Michael holding a Montrance can be found in Mexico. The Spanish mendicant orders began to establish their service in Central America and, and, and sub subsequently in the Philippines, while Jesus, backed by the Portuguese monarchy, promoted missionary work in China and Japan. However, Spanish mendicant orders also penetrated in Japan from the end of the 16th century onward, in part thanks to the Treaty of Zaragoza of, of 1529. As well known, under this treaty, Portugal and Spain divided the East Pacific vertically with the Toyota line passing through Japan. In this historical and religious context, it is reasonable to believe that a disciple of Kola executed the Madonna of the Rosary in the treasure of the Saint Augustine in Manila. For now, the painting is attributed to a Mexican-influenced local Bohol artist of the 18th century, since another painting representing the Madonna of the Rosary by a local Bohol artist of the 18th century is nearly identical in composition to that of the Saint Augustine. However, the two works do not resemble each other stylistically. I argue that the Madonna of the Rosary of Bohol was a local copy of the, modern, of, the, of the Madonna of the Rosary in the church of, in the treasury of St. Augustine. The execution of the Madonna of the Rosary is consistent with that of Archangel Michael in Macau and the Salvatore Mundi by Jacob Niwa. Particularly in the Catholic shape of the ears, eyebrows, and lips, and the decorative motifs in gold such as the edgings. At the same time, the hand gestures and eyes glancing upward recall many figures produced by Kola's school. It should be noted that the subject of this painting is Madonna of the Rosary, originally an important image for the Dominican order, based on the story of Saint Dominic being given the Rosary by the Virgin and the Infant Christ. However, after a victory of the Catholic League over the Ottoman Turks at the Battle of Lepanto 1571, was attributed to the miracle of the Madonna Madonna of the Rosary, this representation became a symbol of the victory of the Catholic Church over paganism and an important icon for the both Spanish and mendicant orders and the Portuguese Jesuit. It remains unknown It reminds I know where the Madonna of the Rosary of St. Augustine was painted. One might assume it was executed in Japan or Macau by Japanese disciple of Kola's school and then sent to Manila. 
On the other hand, it is possible that it was painted in Manila since many Japanese Christians, including Ukon Takayama Ukon or Ukon Takayama, famous Christian feudal lords, fled to Manila from Japan in 1614. Interestingly, never before discussed is its connection to three other paintings in the Philippines that represent the Madonna of the Rosary with a very similar composition currently assigned to the 19th century. One can maybe imagine that the executed Madonna of the Rosary of the Saint Augustine was highly rewarded and that perhaps another similar examples exist or once existed in the Philippines. Finally, I will mention this very similar and primitive painting recently found in the household of, the, of a so-called hidden Christian family in Ikitsuki and small island on the western edge of Nagasaki. During fierce persecution of Christianity in Japan from 1614 until the middle of the 19th century, in some very remote vi villages, especially around Nagasaki, which was the center of the Jesuit mission, crypto Christian or hidden Christian families, families handed down the faith in absolute secrecy from generation to generation, and subsequently, the original Christian faith gradually transformed into their own indigenous beliefs. When the Christian missionaries returned to Japan with the major restoration, many rejoined the Catholic Church. Some hidden Christian families refused to rejoin the church and continued to adhere to their family faith until now. While the denomination of these separated hidden Christians, or Kakure Kiristan, has not been unanimously defined, here I adopt this term, Kakure Kiristan. Ikitsuki Island is one of the places where these Kakure Kiristans currently preserve their own faith. The island differs from other Kakure Kiristan communities in that they have repeatedly reproduced their sacred images called Okake. Essentially, simple and untrained local people executed these peculiar paintings. They repeatedly reproduced Christian sacred images when they were damaged. Intriguingly, the act of reproduction called osentaku, which means laundry in English, and damaged out of use okake are called inkyo, which means retired ad, or retreated in English. Although there is no clue as to their date or attribution, it can be assumed that the works of the seminary of Giovanni Cola came first and with the procedure of Osenta Landry, the images of gradually assumed indigenous traits, as seen, for example, in the case of this Madonna of Child, Ignatius Loyola, and Francis of Xavier. I will discuss the, the face and sacred images of Kakure Kiristan in detail at another time, but today I will focus on this poorly preserved painting. The, re the remarkable part of this osake is the lower image consisting of three identical, nearly identical figures sitting with their legs bent beneath them in Japanese style with kimono and top knot. Top knot. Although the image is partially damaged, all of the figures are clearly holding an object with both hands. It seems possible that this peculiar image emanated from an iconography called Eucharistic Trinity. The notion that through communion with the body and blood of Christ, one enters into communion with God and with the Holy Trinity was represented dogmatically at, after the Council of Trent. 
Consequently, the pictorial representations of the Holy Trinity consisting of three images of Christ became intensified in particular in the areas contiguous with Protestant, no, Protestant territories in the Alpines in Piemonte and Lombardia in Italy, such as frescoes of Sacrament of Giffa and Parish Church in Vienna. Interestingly, later this representation consisting of three images of three uh, Christ was further depicted in large numbers in Spain and above all in Mexico, and then further represented in great numbers in various forms in the Philippines. It remains to be seen from where this iconography arrived in Japan. One assumption is that works of seminary of Giovanni Nicola came first, and with the procedure of Osentaku laundry, the image gradually assumed the indigenous threat. Oh. It is significant that art of color school in Japan was related to Macau, Philippines, and even Mexico across the ocean. This is not surprising as Western missionaries and merchants in the early 17th century moved frequently between three Asian ports of Macau, Manila, and Nagasaki. However, it was not European, but Asians who played a substantial role in the trade of gold, silver, silk, ceramics, and other commodities in this region. The European missionaries just took missionaries and merchants that took advantage of this pre-existing Asian, pre -existing Asian <laughs> networks of exchange, which in turn found connection with Mexico via Pacific Ocean through Spanish merchant orders, uh, uh, mendicant orders and merchants. One can note that this was truly the age of galleon. Thank you, gracias. Sorry for my English. Thank you. That was very interesting um, to conclude with the Trinity and its uh, erosion, Trinity of Christ. Um, oh, um, there's such an interesting idea of Asian Christian forms capitalizing on unusual subjects. And yeah. I see a link here between the Saint Michael yeah. holding the remonstrance with the Christ and a chain without a dragon. You yeah. know, you would think that if you're going to make a point about the Counter-Reformation and about preaching to uh, pagans, that you would have the dragon because it's dramatic and it talks about conversion. And then you ended with these very intriguing um, images of the Trinity, which is also extremely unusual yeah. subject in Europe. Yeah. What's the explanation? Is there a reason for unusual subjects or unusual manifestations of Christian subjects in Asia? Can yeah. you make a, a link there? I think this uh, representation of Trinity consisting of three Christ mm -hmm. is very prevalent in Mexico, in Philippines, and just only one case in Japan. And this iconography has become kind of heretic, actually, in Europe. So me too. I'm very interesting why this iconography spread in Mexico and Philippines and maybe also in Japan. In the case of Japan, maybe we have um, Buddhist deities with multiple heads. So for Japanese people at that time, they, this kind of representation can be more uh, easy to accept. 
also maybe also in Mexico and Philippines, maybe, please teach me, <laughs> there were another kind of, uh, some deities consisting of multiple heads. Yeah. So you think there might be a con connection with the Buddhist trinity that many temples have three bodhisattvas in a row, or yeah, is that a possible? Or a three, yes, yeah, some Buddhist representation of with the three Buddhas, or uh, multiple heads, or uh, well, multiple Buddhas connecting each other uh, no. with head, with legs, this kind of images, yeah. Uh -huh, interesting. And the, the Saint Michael, I mean, you, you present very clear evidence, um, as have your colleagues, that this is associated with um, Jakob Niwa, yeah. 1600, 1607, and mm -hmm. the a documentation that this is placed in Saint, mm -hmm. Saint Paul. Um, why choose a chain without the dragon? I mean, it's a chain that links the abyss, yeah. the abyss. Yeah. Why would that be important for Macau at that moment? Because just to keep uh, the abyss is uh, where the dragon will be kept, <laughs> must be locked kept. away. Yeah. yeah, just locked away. So just to lock away pagans <laughs> yeah. uh. in the new world or in Asia, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Very, very interesting. It just shows the, the uniqueness of these art forms. Yeah. So, um, the audience, um, fascinating talk. Some questions for um, our speaker. Way to the depth. Uh, it's not a, exactly a question, but an observation that in Mexico, uh, you can observe this kind of trinity, Eucharistic trinity, in different places, particularly in the Augustinians, actually, and other places, but then after disappear. And the explanation in general is that uh, it was a great acceptance of the three images, similar or equal, uh, but it was difficult to explain that there were three in one. And then the indigenous people accepted, of course, there are triple or multiple personalities of the deities. It was when the missionaries understood the confusion that existed in popular terms, when they stopped that and they said, no, 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 it's not exactly that. It's the father, uh, son, and the, and the, the Holy, yes, exactly. So, the image is <laughs> changed exactly in the 17th century because it was too confusing. Thank you very much for this very important information. Another question. Another question. Clem, I, you see, seem anxious to ask a question. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, 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 well, you know, Yoshi, thank you for, for, for the very in, insightful lecture and really congratulations on the that fine on the, the, um, the you know, damaged textiles with the, the, the possible, you know, uh, alluding to the Holy Trinity. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I, I didn't know about that but in, in Ikitsuki uh, when, when we went, uh, you know, on, on our visit uh, many years ago and it's it's interesting because Ikitsuki is the example of like you said the the laundering uh, crew sort of creating a lot of all these images uh, in many forms uh, compared to other hidden Christian communities. Um, maybe you, if you want to explain a little bit about that because I think not many of us know that there are different uh, hidden Christian communities that existed and they all seem to have their own form of yeah. tradition and belief. Maybe just to elaborate a little bit about that. Yeah, so until maze restoration, they are having the really numerous of hidden Christian communities, especially in Kyushu area and also in Kinki between Kyoto and Osaka in that area. And uh, Ikitsuki Island is very specific, specific, as it mentioned now, because they uh, mm, they have conserved their own um, okake that's as a, their deities. That's, uh, I think it is because uh, in Ikitsuki, uh, there are 
in Ikitsuki Island, there are several hidden Christian communities that must have been derived from uh, on a kind of confraternity organized by Jesuit during the Christian period, so to speak, Christian period. And during the, um, so to speak, Christian period, they have its own saint, like Virgin Mary or Saint Michael or another saint. And afterwards, in Ikitsu Island, they continue to copy their own saint images. But in another hidden Christian communities that are not so large as in the case of Ikitsuki, they didn't have okake that we that that I sh showed you today. For example, in the case of Sotome uh, near uh, Nagasaki City, they have just um, revered Christian calendar that was day before them. And in another case is also another part of Sotome, also close to Nagasaki. They just imported Chinese porcelain representing guanyin from um, to fire. Um, um, just to uh, believe this, this can be uh, venerated as uh, Virgin Mary. Also, in the case of uh, the um, uh, Ibaraki between Naga um, Osaka and uh, Kyoto. In that case, just they have conserved, cherished just a, a few numbers of very, very beautiful Christian artifacts imported by missionaries during the um, Christian centuries. So, um, from the artist historical point of view, it is very interesting the, is that each Christian, hidden Christian community has its own custom to venerate their own deity or saint images. And thanks so much for this. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have time for one more question. Anyone else? Yoshia, thank you very much. A fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. I have an important announcement to make. Attention, everyone, it's critical. The, um, the award for best dress speaker <laughs> is about to be awarded. May I call up Abraham Villasencio, please? <laughs> I did ask permission to make, uh, uh, make a little joke, but um, <laughs> it's so impressive over the last two days. Equally impressive is Abraham's role as chief curator of the Franz Mayer Museum in Mexico City. Very generous um, lender to this exhibition. A wonderful repository of, uh, of Asian works of art in, in Mexico and much else besides. He has a fabulous exhibition uh, record and of course a great friend now of the museum. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure, it's an honor to be here. Uh, also it's a good pretext to share with you some of my textile passions and today I need to were my peonies, no, uh, one of the legacy of uh, Chinese textiles in Oaxaca, my, my region, in, uh, uh, 
where my family is come from. And also it's for me a pleasure to be with you in this conference because uh, this project uh, was uh, amazing uh, since when I have the opportunity to meet uh, Kenny, Clem, uh, it was fascinating uh, time in the Franz Mayer uh, storage, selecting some pieces, uh, chatting about the possibility of the objects, and it's fantastic uh, for me to be here. And, uh, well, I start with my presentation. Uh, the trace route of the Manila Galleon, or now the China, left a trace on the taste of society on different local artistic expressions such as ceramics, furniture, painting, and textiles. In New Spain, there was no clear idea of the diversity of territories from which the galleon's merchandise came from, not uh, of the towns that produced them. For the people of New Spain, the vast, distant, and enigmatic territories of Eastern Asia were identified with China. It was even believed that practically all the, good, all the goods that arrive on the now are, uh, were Chinese. The administration uh, caused by Asian objects result in the production of numerous luxury goods uh, whose shapes and ornamental motifs were made in imitation of those of China. These Chinese-like objects, known as chinoiserie, represent a complex process of selection, transformation, and adaptation of the Chinese artistic languages, in general Asiatic languages, to the cultural identity and aesthetic values of Western society. Also, many times, the presence of engravings, European engravings provide original and hybrid pieces of art. Many artistic and cultural expressions that the Asian people uh, inherited to the New Spain uh, through their merchandise transcended time and still survive in the traditional arts of states such Michoacán, Guerrero, Puebla, Oaxaca, and Chiapas. Is this. Among the ancient treasures that the Vice-Regal Society appreciate the most in East Chinese porcelain, during the 18th century it was possible to purchase products of various qualities and prices, which allowed practically all houses to have some porcelain objects in their living rooms, oratories, corridors, or rooftops. The combination of blue and white background was a definitive influence for the pottery workshops in the Puebla Tlaxcala region, where it was, produ uh, where it was produced since around 1550-1570 uh, and continues to be made in enamel ceramics or majolica, popular name Talavera. The pottery makers from Puebla molded their pieces with local clay and to emulate the white color of the clay with Chinese porcelain uh, is made, no, Kaolin and Petunse, they use a white glaze uh, made with lead and tin oxide. In the first ordinance uh, of the potters, sorry, yeah, in the first ordinance of the potters of Puebla from 1653, the proportion was established that for each arroba, one kilogram, of lead, six pounds of tin had to be added. The blue uh, glaze used to paint on the white background is composed of cobalt and uh, magnes oxides, a formula very similar to the one used by Chinese ceramists to decorate porcelain. The pottery makers of Puebla made the blue and white combination a distinctive part of their work from the 1650s until nowadays. Currently, now certified workshops keep the same techniques 
of the Viceroyalty alive and continue using both of the white tin glaze and the cobalt oxide blue, an evident legacy of the Trans-Pacific trade of the now. I skip this. The decoration uh, of Puebla pottery follows compositional divisions derived from Chinese porcelain. For example, a keyboard from Museo Franz Mayer shows four large vegetable loaves that descend from the top towers to the central part of its walls, which, alterna uh, which alternate with four medallions where Chinese characters and parrots appear. The same composition can be seen in a, a jar from the Kangxi period belonging to the Asian Civilization Museum. Furthermore, the ancient uh, physical types that the new Spain pottery makers create took as reference the human representation that appeared on the Chinese porcelain for export. They were also influenced by the production of European prints. A uh, Lebrillo from Museo Franz Mayer with the depiction of a stupid man walking with a parasol in hand throughout a field of cactus shows the, the way in which. But these are two lebrillos uh, in, the, uh, the, the, in the right uh, place is this amazing piece uh, that I consider the perfect mixing between Islamic tradition and also uh, Chinese uh, heritage because we can see these beautiful arcs with flowers, birds, uh, and also the man with the parasol, with the umbrella, walking in this beautiful cactus uh, field. You know, these cactus uh, are nopales, very uh, common uh, ingredient in also Mexican uh, uh, diet. Puebla potters create artistic versions uh, of how they imaginate life beyond the Pacific Ocean from the visual sources that they have and their local and daily references. In addition to the Chinese characters, Puebla potters add mythical animals to their creation, such as phoenix bird, symbols of nature, um, symbols of nature such as the clouds motif, scenes of wise uh, men or children playing in open spaces surrounded by pale fences. In addition to traditional Chinese flowers such as lotuses, uh, chrysanthemums, and peonies. Each of these elements was reinterpreted from visual codes and local references. Since most of the figures carried a symbolic load uh, foreign uh, to the viceregal context, many of them were transformed into merely decorative patterns, as happened with the clouds. However, the fusion of legendary images with American animal, such was the case of the phoenix, symbol of the Chinese empress, which was assimilated to the Quetzal, a bird with beautiful plumage that was highly appreciated since the pre-Columbian times and throughout the viceregal period. As, uh, as time passed, the Puebla Chinese, like ceramics, occupied an important place in New Spain's taste, and as the porcelain that arrived in the Manila Galleon, as has been confirmed the inventories of goods from the 18th century. In the exhibition, there is a wonderful lebrillo when the phoenix and a guajolote, a turkey, live together. Among the oriental treasures that arrived from the last year of the 16th century and the first decades of the 17th century were painted screens and lacquered furniture from Japan. The Namban art left mark on Viceroyalty of New Spain that can be seen in testimonies executed between 1660 and 1730. Piombos, or folding screens, are uh, one of the main artistic expressions that Japan uh, 
bequeathed to the West and, therefore, to the Kingdom of New Spain. These works, oscillating between painting and furniture, take their name from the Japanese roots bio, protection, and bu, wine. In the Viceregal inventories, they are mentioned as biogos, biobos, beobos, and biombos. Until now, it is still unclear when and under what condition the earliest Namban biombos arrived in New Spain. However, in several Viceregal works, the legacy of Japanese aesthetics is evident. Is evident. For example, the Museo de America in Madrid houses the famous biombo of the place uh, of the palace of the viceroys in, of Mexico, also known as the biombo of the Plaza Mayor de Mexico, dated between 1676 and uh, 1700. It contains buildings that, in addition to the uh, headquarters of the government, have been identified as the city hall of the capital of New Spain, Royal and Pontifical University, and the Mint. There are also uh, the cajones, the shops of the Parian, the market where, among other products, merchandise from the now the China uh, was sold. Uh, stalls uh, with palm roofs where vegetable are sold and fountains where characters come to get water. Ladies and gentlemen dress according to the customs of the first half of the 17th century, walking through the streets while a carriage pulled by three pairs of horses boards into the square. The descriptive scenes of daily life are interrupted by golden clothes in similar way to how Um, in similar way to how the Japanese painters of Kano family represent storm clouds and the irregularities of the territory, it is striking that just as the Namban masters marked uh, reliefs similar to textiles, uh, brocades, and the clouds of the screens. The painters from New Spain also followed this ex their example, uh, although they simplified the patterns as seen in the screen where the clouds have a diagonal line patterns. However, the biombo has a gold frame with an engraving work that resembles textiles brocades very similar to the motif presence both in the clouds and in the frames of Japanese screens for the Western market. Lequer furniture was another set of Asian luxury items that left a strong market in the applied arts in Viceregal period and our present. Uh, two techniques known in New Spain were raden, which consists in inlaying small cuts of mother of pearl and bone, and the maquier, a word that means gold, since gold and silver dust was applied to create ornamental motifs. Due to this uh, uh, produce in the Viceroyalty, the lacquers that arrived from Asia, Japanese or Chinese, were known as makes. The most obvious influence of Japanese lacquers of Viceroyal arts is identified on furniture with mother of pearl inlaid works produced between 17th and 18th century, whose vegetable patterns are directly inspired by Namban designs. However, the most interesting and complex interpretation of the makes was the painting on wooden boards which pieces of shell in conchados made between 1650s and 1750s. Thanks to the brightness of the mother of pearl, the scenes represent have a unique luminosity due to the brightness of the knacker place under the pictorial layers. For the most part, 
the shell fragments were irregular, although there are some known works that show regular cuts, as uh, Sonia showed us, and were set both in costumes of the characters and in architectural details. Among the artists who have been identified as authors of Enconchados are Juan and Miguel González, Nicolás Correa, Agustín del Pino, Pedro López Calderón, Antonio de Santander, and an artist identified as Rudolfo. The themes that uh, can generally be uh, listed as part of the repertoire that was captured using this technique include first, uh, first of all, the cycle of the conquest of Mexico Tenochtitlan considered the founding story of the Kingdom of New Spain, which was developed in series of several panels, such as those kept by Museo de América in Madrid, Museo Nacional eh, de Bellas Artes in Buenos Aires, Argentina too, or the series divide between Museo Franz Mayer and the Museo Nacional del Virreinato in Tepozotlán in Mexico. Secondly, there are historical cycles of battles that express the military victories of the Catholic kingdoms ruled by members of the Hasbro family. For this purpose, the artists use European prints as visual references as seen in the series of six panels made by the Gonzalez brothers uh, dedicated to the battle of Alejandro Farnese, based on prints by Romain de Hugues that illustrate the book The Three Decades of the Wars of Flanders, written by Jesuit Famiano Strada and Guglielmo Dondini, translated into Spanish by Melchor de Novar and published in Cologne in 1681. The only enconchado screen known uh, the only enconchado screen known so uh, far is also due to the Gonzalez workshop and belong to the Viceroy Jose Sarmiento de Valladares. It represents the siege of Vienna and Belgrade, which is preserved separately, one half in Museo Nacional del Virreinato and the other in the Brooklyn Museum in Nueva York, whose scenes also derive from engravings by Hugh, which are part of the Atlas van Dirk van der Hagen, published around 1690 in the Netherlands. The reverse, the reverse uh, shows hunting scenes, uh, themes that show how a technique of Japanese influence dialogue with European themes and New Spain originality. In addition, very subtle vegetal details appear at its base, inspired by the designs of Japanese lacquered furniture in a pictorial style produced between 1630 and 1690, mainly for the tribe which the Netherlands. It is uh, likely that the pictorial style lacquers also left a uh, mark in the very delicate strokes used to outline characters of represent, uh, or represent trees and mountains which are seen on several panels, such as the Battle of Sempoala and the Conquest of Cholula from Museo Franz Mayer. The third group of themes that the Enconchados painters captured was devotional. Religious cycles such as the life um, of Jesus and Mary, allegories of the creed, a, a, a geographic scenes and devotions to the Virgin Mary, especially, say, especially that of Guadalupe. The Hispanic Society of America in New York has dazzling work signed in 1696 by Nicolas Correa, whose uh, topic is the wedding at Cana, which stands uh, out for the black bra uh, background that dominates the composition similar to the Urushi lacquer, 
also due to the different size of mother of pearl application with were delicately placed to cover the characters, clothing, and ar uh, architectural frames. The silverware pieces and the wood grains on the floor to stage a luxurious atmosphere. The mother of pearl uh, cutouts were painted with warm ochre and gold tones reminiscent of the metallic contrast of the maquille. Museo Franz Mayer houses an interesting Virgen de Guadalupe, Virgin of Guadalupe, signed by Agustin del Pino, surrounded by roses. Both the Virgin's tunic and the uh, cap, as well as the vegetal ornaments, are inlaid with mother of pearl. It has black background frame, uh, uh, which uh, don't, uh, doesn't belong uh, in initially to the, to, to, to the painting, uh, where the shell applications form birds and flowers with rounded petals. These types of frames, like the timings that outline historical panels or other religious scenes, were also made by painters and derive from the corrective patterns typical to Namban's art. Some frames, like the one mentioned here, were very similar to Japanese furniture, while others incorporate local details, such as fruits, as we can see in the scenes of the conquest, no, the, both frames, uh, fruits of various species and colors. The art of the frames also express the way in which Japanese art was interpreted and ap appropriate in New Spain. The impact of Asian artists in New Spain inherited a legacy that is part of the present, the adaptation of Asian forms and techniques in the territory of today contemporary Mexico goes uh, unnoticed. For example, the way Japanese lacquer was received in by royalty always us to understand ident uh, uh, identity patterns in Michoacan maques. In the collection of Museo Franz Mayer, there are maques that depict the Japanese heritage in chest whose patterns are a reference to Namban art. Families from Valladolid, such as Antonio de Ant Anciola, uh, and his son, Juan Ignacio, owned estates on the road from Pátzcuaro to Acapulco. They had a flock of mules with which they brought go uh, goods from Acapulco. Also, Cayetano Gómez de Soria, who traded both in Acapulco and in the port of San Blas, his house located in Portal de Mercaderes in Valladolid, today Morelia, had a receiving room ad uh, adorned with beautiful Chinese vases, ivory figures, and paintings brought expressly by the ships uh, of the East. During the second half of the 18th century, screens and furniture were produced with, uh, what produced mixing different visual languages. For example, Chinese motifs such as clouds, peonies, cherry blooms, willows, oriental characters, boats, birds, butterflies, rocks, pavilions, and bridges are coexisting with hunting scenes and architectural elements of European tradition and specifically hunting scenes coming from England tradition. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting piece. is a gift to the museum. is one of our uh, very, very new pieces. Uh, it's very interesting because reproduce the composition of the Chin uh, a Chinese biombo uh, with these uh, polylobulate frames uh, where are placed uh, some terraces, uh, women 
and uh, it's made uh, on leather uh, with a mixing uh, with oil and tempera. Custom wrist painting um, of the 19th century are witness of the artistic, artistic, cultural, and affective value that the treasures of Manila Galleon maintain over time. This is a painting by Josefa San Roman, one of our first uh, women painters known, and it, uh, it, it's, it reproduces the interior of her house, and it's very beautiful because at the back we can see a Chinese jar. And we know that Josefa San Roman, uh, they used to have a Chinese uh, bottle to uh, put their brushes like the uh, ancient wisdom of China. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was terrific, very interesting. Um, I thought I would start by asking you, um, many, many of these objects have uh, show, of course, the influence of Japan or China, and in some cases, maybe the Islamic Near East, mm -hmm. um, especially in the Talavera pottery. Um, in the 17th and 18th century, were people directly conscious of this? Because to our eyes, we see a little bit of influence, but they're completely independent forms. I mean, Talavera, yes, it's blue and white, but the blue is much stronger than most Chinese porcelain. The design is very different, maybe one or two motifs. There are figures doing very different things that you would find anywhere in Asia. What did people of the time think of it in the 17th and 18th century? What did they say? Did they say, oh, these are Chinese similar? Did they say they were even Chinese or Chinese inspired? What did people think of these things at the time? This is a very interesting question because in the inventories there are mentioned the objects like the China uh, piece of art, uh, the influence of China also uh, was mentioned, but also I think uh, the influence uh, in the uh, pottery, uh, uh, I forgot the, the word, uh, ateliers, uh, was uh, established uh, la between conscient and inconscient, uh, like a tradition. Uh, this is idea, uh, this idea, I, I think, uh, it could be very, very good uh, represented with this reinterpretation of the phoenix because we conserve uh, very delicate uh, jars and also uh, little pieces, azulejos, with precise design of the phoenix, but also we can see uh, how it was translated, how it changed with the time, and also how is something more decorative, something more automatic to create. And also, nowadays, uh, in some workshops, they conserve this specific uh, motif, uh, but we also can uh, we can uh, see another like the alafia. I didn't mention because it's not about uh, the uh, the Chinese or uh, Asiatic influence. It's also a reinterpretation in Spain about the. Uh, uh, Arabic uh, mm. le uh, leathers, but transform also in a motif, only decorative. So we can uh -huh. see these uh, lines like triangles 
or squares that uh, remind us this uh, Arabic influence, but completely unconscious in New Spain and transformed only in a motif. To become a deck, so the callig Arabic calligraphy becomes something like exactly, a de decorative exactly. motif. Like, exactly. Like pseudo Kufic in the, in the exactly. West. Exactly, it's a Kufic uh, heritage, uh -huh. but only decorative. And uh, also, well, uh, I didn't include because it's another topic, it's Islamic influence, yeah. but also in Franz Mayer Museum, we have a very beautiful yard with uh, geometrical flowers. Uh, uh, they are chrysanthemums, but uh, translated in geometrical forms. Uh, and this is another example, how this uh, influence were uh, in the first time probably conscient, but it uh, established and took place in each uh, workshops like uh, like the patterns, the, the, the common patterns. Mm, 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 I see, yeah. It's an interesting problem about how much is really remembered from the sources and whether it's completely transformed or forgotten. I think this is one of the problems many of us uh, uh, face is the forgotten meaning, the original meaning is yes. lost. Yes, and also I think is very similar way to the European engravings mm. because uh, well, in the uh, workshops of, of painters there are collections of engravings but also there are images that took place and it uh, were part of the imaginary of the time, but very similar. Right, right, I see, yeah, interesting. Um, so audience, um, some questions here. Uh, Kenny in the front row. Hi, Abraham. Wonderful to have you here in Singapore. I um, my question is whether the various um, uh, guilds or the, the that that in 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 New Spain in Mexico uh, were had ordinances that that were consciously trying to imitate or reproduce these forms of Asian art. So, for example, you mentioned earlier that the Puebla potters had ordinances about the mixture of uh, materials to get the right. I guess shades. Were there also ordinances that said, "Oh, this is how you know, th th you know, th there'd be certain motifs or certain um, um, ways of um, decorating that uh, 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 you know th th that that constituted uh, Talavera that was actually in some ways a kind of um, imitation of the Asian material." Yeah. I think so, but also it's very interesting. Talavera case uh, could be a synthesis uh, of the different influence in art of New Spain because technique is the same uh, in New Spain time. In nowadays, in the uh, a very precise uh, workshops that the Islamic develops in the ninth century. Uh, the only difference is because uh, we, in our times, uh, use uh, another combustible, it's not uh, wood, but uh, the clays and also the emails are the same. And this is very interesting because it's a dialogue between China uh, the Islamic uh, uh, potteries, uh, uh, cer uh, ceramists in uh, Iraq and Iran uh, region, and after the heritage uh, to the two parts of the world, uh, by Egypt arrived to Spain and arrived after to New Spain, and also from China arrived uh, by the Galleon to New Spain. And uh, these kind of uh, emails are also the same in Islamic art, the tin and lead uh, oxides, and the, the, the cobalt. So I think, uh, yes, uh, for New Spain are two principal in Talavera case uh, influence. Uh, also, the Talavera de la Reina, the original Talavera de la Reina uh, pottery, because uh, in Spain was also uh, appropriate these colors 
uh, on many times uh, with this reference to the combination and uh, in the last uh, years of the 15th century and the first part of 16th century, I think it's very, very uh, an intention uh, to evocate the combination of uh, Chinese porcelain. Yeah. Um, another question. Anyone? Sonia. Thank you very much, Evran. It's a question about the Virgin of Guadalupe by Agustin del Pino, which you mentioned that the, um, has a frame that it is not non-original, and I've heard that before from uh, from the Franz Mayer mm -hmm. staff. And well, it it does make sense because the the sign yes. is not seen if you if you yes. with the uh, frame on. But besides that, which I agree that. Is at least strange, but have do you have any other evidence? Have you tried? I mean, and if so, yeah. would you please tell us? I mean, where this frame come from, or for how long they have been together? Because I think that uh, the work has this frame since it was bought by Mr. Mayor yes. in the fifties or something like that. So thanks. Yes, two years ago we studied uh, eighty-two pieces of our collection. Uh, with the laboratory uh, uh, of the Instituto de Investigaciones Estéticas at the National University of Mexico. And uh, we review with physical and chemical process the, uh, the pieces. And one uh, uh, in the studies uh, was the Virgin of Guadalupe. So it was reviewed with different uh, lights and it was confirmed that the frame is not original but of the virgin, but the frame is original like a specific work. And I think, but Franz Mayer, when he bought the virgin, uh, it has uh, it has the frame uh, uh, and probably is a trans, well, uh, the mix uh, of the panel and the frame probably uh, were together uh, since the last years of 19 centuries. Uh, I, I don't uh, have in other, uh, uh, of the other uh, pieces security, but it's very interesting how uh, enconchados were transformed, like this uh, virgin uh, mixed with the frame, but also how in Conchados uh, the series of the conquest of this one of the Alejandro Farnesio originally was uh, were uh, independent uh, paintings, but I think in the second half of the 19th uh, century uh, were transformed in screens, no, were cut and uh, converted in the form of screen. So this is, uh, yeah, uh, the Alejandro Farnesio is still like a f uh, screen, is part of a particular collection. Uh, and in Museo Nacional del Virreinato, uh, three years ago uh, in, in Franz Mayer Museum, we prepared an exhibition about the representation of the conquest of Mexico. And it was the opportunity also to study these panels and recover the original uh, form uh, was uh, dislocated like a frame, a, a, a screen, and recovered the uh, original form. Yes, yes. So it's a very, very interesting topic because I think it's a, uh, reinterpretation uh, in the collections in the second half of 19th century. Oh, that's really interesting. Yes, yes so it's the life of the objects. Yeah, hear more about these transformations and re rebuildings. Yeah, yes. fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, audience, for participating. Thank you very much. <laughs>